Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1 in by 1 in, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator for technology startups. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. In support of that mission, we do these free mentoring roundtables every week, week after week after week. This is the hundred and uh, this is the five hundred thirty third session, and uh, over one hundred fifty thousand people have participated in these. It started way back in two thousand eight, so it's been a very long journey with this mode of engagement with the startup community. The event is being recorded. Every single roundtable recording is available on our YouTube channel, One in One in Roundtable. On Twitter, you can use hashtag 1M1M. Our handles are at 1M by 1M and at Shromana. We publish continuously great material. This is a roundtable, not a broadcast, so we do want you to participate as much as you would like to. So I will put the slide up a bit later. And also, nowadays, WebEx allows you to just activate your computer audio and participate as well. We are going to speak today with uh, Jean Caballero, co-founder at GreenPal. Jean, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, let's talk a little bit about GreenPal and a bit about your background to start off. Yes, yeah, so um, I've kind of been in the landscaping industry uh, my whole entire life mainly as a surplus to, uh, you know, to make a little bit of money in high school, in the summers, and even in, uh, and even in college. And uh, so I've kind of been in that, uh, that arena for a while. And um, once I got my first, I guess, corporate job, uh, it was in tech sales. And uh, my territory was the West Coast. And so I was kind of privy to newer technologies like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, and, uh, you know, having my landscaping background, I knew that, you know, if somebody was going to summon a stranger to pick them up, to take them somewhere, uh, they would do the same with lawn care. And that's kind of how the idea of Green Pal came about. And uh, where are you based? Uh, we are based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Right. So <laughs> that's a, this is a very interesting look at a case study the reason i thought it would be fun to have you over here is uh, is to expose a part of the world that we don't hear from very much in the startup conversation so uh, so uh, Jean, i know you have followed a, a very lean startup process mm -hmm. and you start, your journey starts with bootstrapping with a paycheck which is a methodology element that is a, an important one in our arsenal. We are building a lot of companies using this particular methodology element. So talk a little bit about how you got GreenPal off the ground, especially what part of the journey did you do while still holding on to the job, the first job? Yeah, so uh, I bootstrapped with a paycheck for about five years. Um, you don't realize how much time in a day you, you actually have until, uh, you know, you can uh, utilize pretty much all of it. So, and my paycheck was, job was, was very, very flexible. So I knew I could go in at seven and be done at four. So I had, you know, at least six good hours of, uh, of work that I could do. Um, but a lot of the things that, that, that we were able to do, um, we were able to launch an MVP. We were able to talk to as many consumers as possible. You know, we were able to aggregate vendors, um, you know, uh, post, you know, 5 p.m. So a lot of the things that we did for growth were after hours. And, uh, you know, we we're very fortunate to be able to uh, be underwritten by, uh, by a paycheck. Um, so we didn't have to go into debt and we certainly didn't have to, you know, find any uh, seed funding or any uh, or any money like that. So uh, we're very fortunate to to be able to take our time, I guess, to, to launch GreenPal while not getting into debt, while being able to do things, um, you know, that were financed by the nine to five. And what was your day-to-day -day 
day job while you were doing this on the side? Yeah, I was a uh, sales manager for a Fortune 50 tech company. So I sold wow. the computer solutions, a little bit of everything. All right. And um, did your employer know that you were, uh, you know, bootstrapping Green Pal in parallel with your job? Uh, there were there were a few people that knew um, one of uh, one of my my late managers the manager I had the longest he he knew and he was actually a customer of Green Pal um, oh. and we actually you know after hours on the weekends uh, the the company I worked with had a huge facility and so we actually did some work uh, out of there on the weekends uh, you know there was hundreds of conference rooms and stuff like that so we had to actually utilize the campus to. Uh, uh, to have meetings and, and stuff like that. So uh, I don't, you know, at the time it was after hours, so I don't think it mattered, but uh, they probably frowned upon it if I was there during the day. Very good. And um, how did you get your MVP done? You're not a technical founder. Your, um, your background is in sales. So did you hire an outsourcing agency? How, who did the MVP? Yeah, so um, we kind of took a, a, a weird journey getting our MVP up and going. Uh, so I've got two co-founders, and none of us actually had any, uh, you know, tech background. Um, so we thought the the best thing would be to do is to hire a local um, shop to build our to build our product and build our mm -hmm. apps, and so. We paid them one hundred fifty thousand dollars to uh, to build what we thought was going to be the best way to connect homeowners with landscape professionals. And uh, it actually turned out to be one of the best, most expensive mistakes we ever made. Uh, when they gave us the product, it was unusable. Um, you know, it had no usability to it. Uh, you know, it just, it, it was horrible. So we knew that we needed to have a technical co-founder uh, on our team to, to take this to the next level. And so one of our co-founders actually went ahead and quit his day job. He was actually working at the same company that I was working at. He went ahead and quit and was in the first cohort of the Nashville Software School um, uh, here in Nashville. So he went to software school, uh, took him about six months, and then we actually hired a, uh, a consultant that kind of hand in hand helped him build the actually first true MVP that we had. And uh, that's the, the rest is kind of history. So uh, he's, you know, he kind of manages the, the day to day of our tech team, which is about 25 now. And uh, that's basically how we got our MVP. Um, the only thing we kept from the uh, shop built website was uh, they made a how it works video it was like a minute and a half. And uh, so we kind of joke around and say we paid $150,000 for a minute and a half video. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about how you seeded the marketplace. You obviously did a two-sided marketplace of homeowners and lawn uh, people who wanted to mow their lawns, right? Mm -hmm. that, was the, um, that was the marketplace that you created. So. How did you get the two sides of the marketplace on your MVP? Yeah, so uh, I wish I could tell you it was uh, it was fun, but it wasn't. Um, we literally to get the vendors, we literally went to Craigslist and cold called vendors in the Nashville area until we had about twenty that were uh, willing to listen to us a little bit more, and then we went to their job site and talked to them. You know, one on one at the benefits of uh, of joining a platform like Green Pal, and then we physically signed them up on our platform for them. So that's kind of how we uh, we actually did that for the first, I'd say, ten to fifteen markets. You know, we were texting vendors, calling vendors, just manually doing that whole entire process. Uh, and then once you have you know ten to fifteen vendors in a Nashville area, uh, we kind of started leaning on. Um, on going door to door. Uh, we did that for about two months, basically just going to large neighborhoods that uh, were very dense, knocking on the door and saying, hey, uh, we have this new product. Um, and uh, instead of, you know, calling around to get for, instead of calling around and getting quotes, you can go to this website, enter in your address and local landscaping pros will then, um, 
will then bid on your property and you just kind of manage that online through GreenPal. So that's kind of how we got the first, uh, the first market Nashville started. And, uh, you know, through the, through the vendor side of it, we did that through, you know, the first 15 to 20 markets was hand cranking manually, physically talking to these vendors. And what about the other markets? Those you were not visiting, right? You were not lo local to be able to visit. How did you acquire the consumer side in these other markets? Yeah, so the consumer side, we started to rely heavily on PR. Um, until this day, that's probably one of our best channels. Uh, we don't spend any money on advertising uh, on the consumer side. We rely heavily on organic SEO and PR, and that has done well for us. Um, and the vendor recruitment side right now is um, we have a Facebook campaign that uh, we want to large launch in Duluth, Minnesota. We turn on that Facebook campaign and we can have 15 to 20 vendors in that area in a couple of days. So, you know, changing that over to, to being digital allows us to launch, you know, you know, 50, 60 markets per year. Okay. So, um, in this mode, as you were growing, you know, city by city, um, and you had, you said you had three co-founders who were all bootstrapping the company with a paycheck. One of them quit to become the technical person who brought mm -hmm. your MVP to life. What about you and the other co-founder? Both of you were still bootstrapping with a paycheck? Yes, we were both still bootstrapping with a paycheck. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that, that, that needs to be done. Um, you know, you can wireframe, um, you know, the website, uh, we were doing usability studies, um, you know, with, with friends and family, we actually rented a, uh, uh, like a, like a booth at a mall, uh, for a couple weekends, just so we could get feedback from, you know, from, from strangers and strangers are pretty willing to tell you the truth. Like, Hey, this is uh, our product. Do you mind just going through the sign up process and telling me, you know, where you have any uh, doubts or where you have any friction or anything like that. So we did a lot of that stuff. So by the time we were ready to like physically get this designed by a, uh, by a designer, we knew the, the customer flow uh, and we knew the onboarding pretty well because we'd done so many uh, usability tests, you know, just on with random people. And your business model is what? This is lawn mowing is an ongoing job, right? Is it, are people, uh, are the vendors getting customers on an annuity basis? They're on a monthly subscription basis or are they getting kind of like as and when? What's the, how does it work? Yes, yeah, so uh, our, we're a true platform. So we just take 5% of the transaction. So vendors can sign up on our platform and bid on our platform for free. Um, we just take 5% of the transaction. Uh, margins are very, very thin in landscaping. And, you know, homeowners are looking to, to save a buck when they can. So, you know, we feel that the 5% uh, was fair for the, the added value um, that we're able to give to the landscaping professionals. But is it subscription or is it transaction? Is the same lawn it's, going it's going It's transaction. It's transaction. Mm -hmm. And what we uh, found okay. is that vendors love to keep their customers on GreenPal because we make it just so easy for them to, to manage it uh, and get paid after every mow. So, you know, they don't have to go home and send an invoice. You know, they don't have to, uh, you know, get on Google Maps and, and make the route out for the day. GreenPal basically does all that for them. I see. Okay, cool. So, um what about metrics? How was this growing? How many cities? How many customers? What, what was the growth of the business like as you were bootstrapping this? Yeah, so uh, this year we're projected to do about $35 million in, uh, in GMV. Um, that was up. When did you start? Uh, $35 million in gross. No, when did you start, when did you start the Sorry. company? It, we started in 2012, but we didn't actually start uh, uh, keeping our tally on uh, on revenue until about 2015. So uh, we've had really, really good growth, um, you know, since then. 
Um, you know, fortunately, we were able to provide a contactless service during the pandemic, and we were able to grow 25% in 2020 during the, uh, the whole uncertainty. So, um, you know, year over year, we've been able to grow almost 100% until, uh, you know, until COVID. And it looks like this year we'll, we'll be up to, you know, 50% growth from last year. And is it is the 35 million number that you're quoting, is that growth? Um, business that gets transacted on the side, or is it your revenue? That is the the gross revenue. Uh -huh. Gross revenue. So five percent of that is your revenue, really. That is correct. That's what we keep what we use to keep the lights on. All right, got it. Okay, cool. So, um, and you bootstrapped it all the way, right? There has been no financing in this ever. Has has not been um, when we needed the money. That's when nobody was calling. Um, now we probably get a phone or an email every couple of weeks, you know, asking if we would like to take any venture funding on. Um, so, you know, we've gone this far, you know, we've utilized, you know, some short-term debt um, to help grow, but no institutional funding. And how many people in the company? Uh, there's three total co-founders, including myself. And we have a team of about 25 uh, that work for us in various parts of the world. I see. So it's a, largely a virtual company? Correct. Mm -hmm. And what have you learned in building this as a virtual company? What resources have you tapped into? Oh, um, uh, Upwork is a beautiful product. Um, you know, the, the, the hiring process has been, um, you know, in, in, in the beginning it was challenging, but, uh, but, you know, the first five hires of your company are so, are so critical to, to its growth and its longevity. And, you know, we made a few mistakes, uh, in the beginning hiring people, um, you know, and a lot of the times when you're hiring somebody, you know, you can't really hire somebody in the United States because you just can't afford them. Um, so, you know, we had to look to outsource that and, uh, you know, a lot of the times when you're talking to somebody overseas, they have no idea what grass is. So there's a learning curve that, um, that, that, that they have to learn, you know, to be able to work on your project. Where are you those people? Oh gosh, we have them all over, all over, uh, a lot in India. We have some in Germany, uh, have some in, um, in Europe, in Canada. Um, so you have, uh, you are managing the technical team? Correct. Uh -huh. From your organization and so you're not outsourcing to an agency, you are managing the whole technical team. We are, we are managing all of it. Mm -hmm. How many of the 28, 30 people that you have in the company, including founders, are technical? I'd say everyone but me. <laughs> No, meaning if they're all working on technical projects? No. Yeah, uh, we we actually have um, we have a designer um, that does not have a technical background, and we have about three or four content writers. So I'd say ninety percent uh, have technical backgrounds, and mm -hmm. to, including myself, do not. And um, your pitch to these. To the sell side of this two-sided marketplace, obviously, obviously, when you first get them on, is that they're going to get exposed to more customers. Mm -hmm. When, when you actually play that pitch out and actually see execution on that premise, what happens? What What are your use cases of how? What percentage of the revenue are they making off your platform once they are settled in and and rolling on the platform? Yeah, so um, if you're a large landscaping company, you already have your processes in place. Uh, you don't need a, a green pal to help you get business. You don't need a green pal to streamline your your uh, your payments and all that stuff. So our vendor is the guy that's just starting out or the guy that has five to 10 lawns that wants to grow that to 50 or 60 lawns. That is our vendor that that seems to do well. Uh, once we get a vendor 10 properties or more, 
Um, they are about 90% going to bring on their non-Green Pal customers. And this is kind of where we're seeing uh, a lot of our unanticipated growth is that, you know, you're, you're aggregating these landscaping professionals and you give them a tool to, to bring on their non-Green Pal customers and, uh, you know, because they don't want to fool with it the old way, you know, they don't want to send invoices and they don't want half and half on a digital platform and a non-digital platform. So um, when we see that we can, we can, you know, bolster a vendor's business, um, we see them basically running their whole entire business through GreenPal. And that's kind of what we've seen a lot uh, recently that kind of has helped our growth. You know, it's, it doesn't cost us anything for them to, you know, bring their 30 customers onto GreenPal and, uh, and, and let them manage all of that through our platform. So that's kind of one, one bit of growth that we've seen a lot that uh, we anticipated, but we didn't anticipate it to be um, as, as, as highly profitable as it, uh, as it is. Jane, um, I want to make a comment um, just to underscore what you're doing as a you know, key methodology element in building two-sided marketplaces that we are seeing elsewhere as well, and you're providing another instance, another example of this phenomenon. It is what I call SaaS-enabled marketplaces, mm -hmm. software as a service-enabled marketplaces. What you're providing essentially is a piece of software to manage a lawn mowing business, a mom and pop lawn mowing business. Mm -hmm. uh, very small lawn mowing business. And people are coming to you and bringing their customers to you because they want you to help manage those customers using that software. So typically when we first started seeing marketplaces, let's say eBay was the first marketplace in history, people came to eBay mainly in search of customers. Mm -hmm. But today, we are seeing this vertical two-sided marketplace trend extensively. In all industries, all verticals, there are all kinds of two-sided marketplaces that we are seeing. And as a result of that, we are seeing these kind of vertical-specific software emerge. And your lawnmower business management software is a little piece of example of that where it's a very specialized, very niche kind of product, and people are coming in not just in search of customers, but also because they want to use your software to manage their businesses. And this is, this is happening everywhere. Um, another trend that we have seen along these lines is that people start with kind of a verticalized software product where they give the software first and maybe even charge a bit of subscription and People come for the software and then start the marketplace once they have critical mass. That's another way of playing the two-sided marketplace trend, mm -hmm. especially using this verticalized, very niche software uh, capability. So um, just wanted to underscore what you're doing is something that we're seeing elsewhere as well, and it is becoming a best practice for running verticalized two-sided marketplaces. So please keep going. Uh, you were offering more insights from your journey, and I, I just wanted to underscore this one, which I think is phenomenally important. Yeah, you know, and in, in, in the beginning of uh, of the journey, you know, we talked to so many landscaping professionals, and uh, you know, our our uh, our offer seemed almost too good to be true to them, and so you know, the reason we didn't fully go with uh, a SaaS product is because, you know, we haven't really given them anything yet. You know, um, hey, you know, give us ten dollars a month, and we're gonna hopefully get you customers. Uh, you know, if that was if that would have been the conversation to to jumpstart our first few markets, um, work. it wouldn't work. You know, um, you know, now we probably could. You know, like now we've got could. now we certainly could, um, but there's just so much white space and so many other ways that 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 we think we can, you know capture more revenue from the customer that we already have that, uh, you know, the, the, the subscription model would probably uh, be way down the road. I think with also a subscription type is you're almost beholden to, uh, to maybe handhold uh, the individuals that are paying that subscription. As of right now, uh, the only 
vendor, uh, I guess, customer service is we have a Facebook group. It has about 3,000 uh, Green Pal uh, professionals on it. And, and, and basically, uh, they post a question in there. And uh, we have Green Pal vendors that have been through us since day one answer the question of the guy that just joined. So it's like a self-propagating customer service that, uh, that, that we've created. And there's no need to hire anybody to take the call of somebody that's giving you $15 a month to reschedule an appointment. So that was kind of something that we did knowing that, hey, we got to keep our costs down. We can't afford anybody to do customer service, uh, especially on the vendor side. Um, you know, when it is, uh, when it is really not necessary. So that's kind of another reason we kind of stayed away from the, you know, the true software as a service, uh, business model, but, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. If you were, if you charge subscription to any kind of customers, you will have to provide customer support against that. And, and your choice is that you want to make it more as much of a self-service product as possible and, and. Uh, in a transaction model, uh, you're saying that you don't have to provide much customer support, and your community is providing the customer support. But yeah. I, you know, I can, I could foresee also pushing back on that. If even if you were charging subscription, your community is so, you know, so tight and so well versed, they would probably still provide customer support. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's some. Uh, we we have a. a... We designed and, and and built a vendor handbook that basically, you know, you can find any answer to any question on how the app works, but it's probably utilized maybe 10% of the time. So we tried to not force them, but we try to suggest to them, hey, read this. It takes 10 minutes and it'll answer a lot of your questions that uh, that you have about, you know, how things work and uh, what to do in certain situations. But uh but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, being in a, a bootstrap, you want to save as much money as possible. And that Facebook uh, group has saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars and thousands of hours of, of you know, tedious work. Sure. Now, what is your guidance to the uh, audience on when is a good time to quit uh, bootstrapping in a Pay, bootstrapping with a paycheck situation and jump full time into your venture. What yeah, so I think it's going to be different with uh, with everybody. You know, I I've mentored some people in in the Nashville area that that never quit their job. They still do both. Um, so I think it's different with every individual. What you know, what my key like point was when I need more time doing green pal than I do at my day job, that is when, um, that is when I'm going to, you know, make the leap. And so, yeah. you know, there was, it was April 17th of 2007 is when that was my last day at my, uh, at my corporate job. And it was just, okay, I can't, I can't keep doing both because there's not enough time in the day. And 2017. Uh, 2017. Yeah. So it was uh, it's a long way. It's a very long time, but you know, I mean, you sacrifice a lot. Uh, you don't have any weekends. You don't have a social life, um, you know, and friends turn into acquaintances because you don't have time to hang out with them. Um, and it's a lonely journey and uh, make sure you're, uh, you know, make sure you're in it with, uh, with the people that you like and can stand the most. So it's a very, that's also, some of it is personal choice. Um, some people, do a very long bootstrapping with a paycheck journey and some people you know once things become sustainable once project products become validated then revenue is anything and uh, you don't necessarily need the paycheck to sustain yourself uh, a lot of people do quit and go full-time with the venture mm -hmm. the other nuance that uh, we should point out is that if you're trying to raise money um, before an investor is going to write a check, most likely they will require that you quit your job. However, mm -hmm. we have seen um, very good case studies of people bootstrapping with a paycheck all the way until getting a, you know, angel or venture funding. 
and uh, and then quitting their job. So that's also fine. Or um, we've also seen this is a very interesting situation. We also see people applying to Y Combinator, right? Strapping with a paycheck first and getting validation yeah. and, and get the business rolling and then go into Y Combinator <laughs> and get exposure to a lot of investors and so forth. So we're seeing the 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 reason I. I'm so bullish about bootstrapping with a paycheck as a methodology, and I wanted to showcase your journey, Jean, is to is is that it is it works. You know, it yeah. really works. It can work. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot of sacrifices that have to be done, um, but it, it it certainly can work. And uh, you know, most most startups don't die by homicide; they die by uh, by natural causes, and a lot of those natural causes are running out of money. So, you know, if you can help extend the runway by, you know, driving for Uber or Lyft or mowing lawns or, or, or staying with your corporate job, you know, it extends that runway and, you know, gives you more options to, to be more flexible. And if you defer taking money, you know, you're, you're, you're more metrics driven and uh, you can move a little bit quicker and you don't, you don't have a job or a boss. Um, so, you know, I, I, the, the, I heard a parallel saying that uh, uh, venture capitalists are like, they're like hitchhikers. As long as, you know, as long as they like where your car is going, they'll keep paying, they'll keep paying for the gas. But as soon as they don't like the direction that the car is going, they'll, they'll kick you out of your car and uh, they'll start driving. So, you know, smiles and, and very often they will drive you down the cliff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> There's not a wrong answer. Um, we just didn't have the option in the very beginning to take any to take any money, and uh, it was a blessing. And you know, here we are, you know, self-funded, and uh, we're just going to keep going that way. Dean, last question: What has it been like uh, working on this venture out of the Nashville area? You know, at first we thought it was going to be uh, we thought it was going to be tough and detrimental. Um, you know, nothing really, no platform has ever come out of Nashville and Nashville's really tech heavy, uh, right now, just in healthcare. So there was not a lot of people to, to lean on, um, here to say, Hey, you know, how do you start this? How do we go about this? So, you know, we had to rely on, uh, Eric Reese and Steve Blank on telling us, you know, what to do and, uh, hours and hours upon podcasts of people that have done what we're trying to do. So, um, I think starting a company is, you know, is kind of location agnostic. I don't think it matters. Um, no, not at all. Today, there are too many resources with which you can learn and, and uh, you can do it anywhere. This was, you know, when we started One Million by One Million, that was really the best vision that we started with is to really democratize entrepreneurship and education <laughs> and tradition and acceleration. And, yeah. uh, and we've done that and the world has moved definitely become a globalized entrepreneurship ecosystem, very much so. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Dean, for sharing your story. It was a pleasure to have you on, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Good luck. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, we're going to do some entrepreneur mentoring next. Um, remember, this is a safe working session, and um, you – are very welcome to share whatever is bothering you. You don't need to be nervous. You don't need to be defensive. We are on your side. So, you know, let's just talk through what is it that you need help with and, and we'll see what we can do. Um, it's possible that you might disagree with my feedback and that's fine. Uh, it's your venture, you do what you want. But, you know, feedback obviously that we give is very, uh, very much a product of a lot of experience and a lot of work. So um, take it into consideration and then decide how you want to play your hand. Manuel Mioni, it's your uh, turn to start. My, my... Uh, here we go. Perfect. Go on. Okay. Anyway, um, I just want to give you a little bit of my background, what I've done in the past, and uh, and also it's about time I do it on my own because I work with uh, companies like Outback, TGI Fridays, and Applebee's, 
you know, creating their menus. And therefore, you know, you don't make as much money as, you know, you actually want to, you know, as you would because, you know, you can't start, you know, your own. So I was mm -hmm. like that, working with restaurants, you know, for almost 20 years. And I said, no, wait a minute. You know, things are, you got to be an entrepreneur and think that way. And therefore, you know, launch your own, you know, company, which is a restaurant. So Sechinelli is just the, uh, the idea that I'm going to, that I want to be established in South Las Vegas Boulevard. And this uh, uh, this this uh, uh, restaurant would feature, you know, just the best pizzas and you know directly the recipes from Italy and also pastas. Even my son, I call him my little chef because he's 13 and he's already really good at creating salsas and pizzas and other stuff that he invents. So it's quite an influence that I you know have you know you know to him. Are you but trying to launch a restaurant? Is that what you're saying? Or is it a, a takeout service? Or it's like a delivery service? What are you thinking? Uh, what, I'm, what, what it is, what I want is a place where people can dine and have a, a glass of wine and, you know, listen to nice Italian music. Also, it's the best pasta that I make. You know, and uh, I have the menu down further down and also the financials, you know, and everything that we need to get us started. I see. So, um, you know, Manuel, I, I'm happy to chat with you and listen to you. Um, I think we had some confusion when Maureen uh, put you on the show is, is to understand whether we were trying to do it actually sit down restaurant uh, kind of business or are you trying to do a takeout business because right now you know everybody is doing a lot of you know online ordering and delivery kind of businesses oh our yes specialization, hang on our specialization is in technology and technology enabled services so restaurant is not our specialty it's not an area that we work in so um Tell me how we can, what, what is it that brings you here? What are you looking for? I understand you're trying to start a new Italian restaurant, but what, uh, what brings you here? What brings me here is that, you know, I have other projects that I already pitched for, and I already pitched, and, you know, just because I'm working with somebody else, I don't qualify either, so I don't understand. I'm sorry? Like you said, you know, this idea is to hire people so they can and create jobs, okay? And therefore, you know, this is an idea that, you know, I, because I'm good at it and I'm also good at other things. No, no, I don't doubt that you're very good at what you do. We don't have the expertise in how to start restaurants. That's my point. But I do. Yeah, but you, this is a mentoring session, right? People come here to get mentoring from me. If it's not my expertise, how can I mentor you? Okay, uh, Mrs. Mitra, thank you so much, okay? And I appreciate You're it. Don't welcome. call me anymore, okay? Because I'm just wasting my time. Goodbye. Uh, I think it was a waste of time. All right. Let's see who's next. Alejandro Fernandez from Austin, Texas. Yes. Alejandro, what are you working on? Uh, a, a tech startup. So I think it'll be under <laughs> your umbrella. So uh, yeah, appreciate it for, for taking taking some time here. Um, I'm Alejandro Fandez here, uh, a startup based out of Austin, Texas, the, what they now call the Silicon Hills. So there's a lot of, obviously, Austin, Austin has startups. really come up as a tech uh, hub, very much so. Yeah, so we're creating the most secure uh environments to um to access your information um and we're focused on high trust environments uh small to medium businesses lawyers cpas journalists those are kind of the first people we're targeting uh we already mm -hmm. have some uh traction which, which we'll go into but 
Uh, we're, we're targeting businesses and then we're targeting applications. And I'll go into what our offerings are and the elimination of unauthorized access is the pain that we're, we're removing. And the okay. solution is uh, patent pending persistent user authentication. Um, and I can actually show you, well, the invisible- Before we go to software acquisition, Alejandro, help me understand how this works and, and what is it? So if I'm a lawyer and I'm your customer, Yes, exactly. What, are, what am I getting from this? So what you're getting is you're getting this. I'm going to show you if you can see me here. I'm going to show you we have this MVP right now. And essentially what it is is the persistent user authentication is patent pending. And what it does is it uses biometrics to persistently authenticate the person in front of the device. So essentially imagine the moment I have a device in front of me, whatever is mine, whatever I want access to, I can see. But the moment I put it down, or the moment I hand it to someone else, or we also have second face detection. The moment someone's over my shoulder, the screen yes. obfuscates. And so what okay. we did is we decided to create a low hanging fruit MVP proof of concept messaging app. Now this technology of if it's me, show me, if it's not, don't show me can be applied to any different application in the iOS store. That's what we have. So we have the framework, any other application that exists can use this what we call persistent user authentication or for lawyers, CPAs, journalists, if you want to talk to your clients or customers and you want to have a complete assurance that when you're communicating with them, only them are like when, when like if I receive a message from you, I know that you're the only person that could have sent it. And so just to give you so it's a just, secure mess messaging framework. Yes. Um, well, and so, this is a secure so messaging app. So you could so, either go to market as an app selling to lawyers and CPAs and journalists, whatever. And and also you you can go to market as a framework that other apps use Leverage. to enable their, okay, got it, I got it. So, yeah. So um, now these are two different businesses and as a small startup generally trying to do too many things doesn't work so well. So what I, what is your thinking about how you want to go to market? So our plan, we already have um, some pilots here in in Austin, Texas, uh, we have uh, four law firms. We have two CPAs. We also have a psychology practice. Um, we truly believe that the the you know we we want to de-risk the company by having right multiple multiple revenue streams. I, I do hear you as, as it relates to right not spreading yourself too thin. Um, but we do believe that the persistent user authentication as a framework is probably where we get the most traction, the most money, because these people would already have existing applications. They would just insert this as a privacy security layer. As it compares to the application, the full-blown application, having to get someone to download another application, change their user behavior. Uh, again, they already have multiple messaging applications. That's a little bit of a harder sell. Um, we do still want to have the, that multi-pronged approach um, but we, we see, you know, right now we're already in talks. The freight, the, the app came out first, the framework, uh, has just been out for a couple of weeks and we've already received some, some interest and some traction, um, with a couple of FinTech white labeling applications or white label, white labeling app companies. So now when they're creating the mobile wallet, let's say, um, one of them here in Austin is called. Praxen. So when they're creating your app, they can offer this as a privacy security layer within your application. Um, so that way we don't have the customer acquisition cost can be less if they serve as a reseller of the technology. Alejandro, is there a, a place, whether it's on LinkedIn or uh, Facebook or some, you know, website, some, you know, developer network of sorts where uh, this kind of privacy secure messaging framework is naturally being discussed in the as developers are developing apps and this this topic is being discussed extensively so you, are you familiar with any so developer not, network so not not now not yet and the the main reason is the the framework is we just launched the framework. I mean, we, we've been working on the framework, but we've just launched the framework, uh, like the Git, the GitHub repository is now 
public, I think, this past week. Uh, so we've been really focused heads down on the app. But uh, we recently have had a couple of uh, conversations where people have told us just like look for like a network of developers. Like you just want to get in front of a thousand that's developers right. and, and let that's them spread. Exactly right. So that's 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 like what our next step and that's that, that's what we want to do. Um, I know that privacy and security is really big. I know two step two factor authentication is becoming the norm. One thing that we like to say is that even when it's two step two factor authentication, the text message gets to your phone, but it doesn't necessarily get to you. If anyone else is holding your phone, they can easily take that six digit code and log in with with our application it is persistently checking it's only you you and only you viewing that so i know if i send you something i know that you're the only person that's going to see it and conversely for me to be able to send so something, i understand the value proposition i'm trying to think through the go-to-market strategy sure. sure um how are you going to find if you want to sell the framework you really need to get into developer networks i would look for fintech Developer networks, are there app developer networks that specifically focus on FinTech tech apps? Are there app developer networks specifically focused on health tech apps where you can go and, and start kind of publicizing this thing so that there are people who took it, take it up? Now, um, lawyers, this is a $9.99 product. You have to sell through marketing, right? If people will have to find you and buy your product, you don't have enough, um, you know, revenue or margin here to go recruit customers by hand, mm -hmm. right? Okay. That's what we've been, um, yes. Unless you go after bigger law firms and do enterprise deals. Yeah, we, we were doing smaller law firms locally to get pilots, to get feedback. And the idea was once we had traction there, once we got that feedback to go for bigger law firms. And that's kind of where, where so we're at are, right now. But yeah. Each of these that we're talking about are different businesses. Okay. A developer, you know, go-to-market strategy is a very different business than going after lawyers and, and enterprise deals with lawyers. It's a very different business. And um, you, you're going to have to pick one you won't have the resources to do all of them so sure. where where is your personal advantage unfair advantage as we call it what is your expertise what is you know who are you where do you play the best and your team where do you have the greatest strength in all these options yeah i mean i i, I believe the the enterprise is where they could maybe be earlier adopters of new technology. Because when we go to the smaller to medium businesses, even though you're able to talk to the decision maker quicker, um, they they might not feel the pain or the necessity to be able to, or to want to make a move. So I think okay. this is, this is uh, you know, we're trying to find early adopters. I mean, and again, with, with technology that uh, is new and not in the market. Uh, you know, sometimes you you run run the risk of not finding them quick enough. Um, but so in that case, Go in ahead. that case, your your next immediate next step is to really understand the secure messaging vendors who are playing in the legal uh, industry, who are catering, who are selling to enterprise law firms, large law firms large and medium law firms and, and understand who's doing what, what is the real competition that you're going to be facing, how do you differentiate, how do you position, and then figure out a go-to-market strategy specifically focused on that. I mean, what this, this slide really scares me in that it's too much for a small company to do all these things is not viable. So it's good that you're getting you know, already you've got some law firms using it, you've got some CPAs using it and so on, but I think you're going to have to soon put a stake on the ground and sure. figure out how exactly are you going to go to business, go to market. So, so if, if we, if we did want to go for, uh, more the framework, would you say we just 
not work that much on the app on selling the app i mean would, would it yeah, would it be absolutely. like 80 20 but we'd, we'd still like push the app because we did create it or would you just leave it there and if it organically grows it organically grows that's right that's because it's good it's not going to sell itself on its own you're going to have to put in significant sales and marketing resources to sell this thing and um, whichever direction you decide to go whichever type of company you decide to build is going to require all your energy and all your resources to market to sell to close deals and so on so I mean, developers who want to use your framework are going to need handholding. They're going to need customer support. They're going to need, you know, they're going to need attention. And um, you know, when do they start generating money? What that's uh, the path to cash is is long. Even in enterprise deals, actually, the path to cash is quite long. So how are you going to manage this intermediate phase, etc.? There's a whole bunch of you know, kind of blocking and tackling that happen in the early stages of a venture before you can, um, you know, find your stride. Sure. I did just want to very quickly just show you what it looks like. I mean, just, just because it's like a highly demonstrable thing. So I'm looking at a messaging, our, our messaging app, it's called Invisible Ink. And it's called Invisible Ink because it goes invisible like that. So if I had my okay. phone sitting down, someone would grab it, they'd see this. But the moment I lift it up and I look at it, I see the messages. Okay. So it's it's persistent. I'm sure they're in. I haven't looked at the full ecosystem map of secure messaging recently, but secure messaging is a space in its own right. It's a, you know, I constantly get messages from my banks, Morgan Stanley, Comerica, etc., and and I have to go through wrestle through a lot of secure messaging. It's actually a very bad product. For some reason, the secure messaging products are really user-unfriendly products. So um, so I think you, if you want to go the enterprise route, of course, you can play a you know, role in, in that, And if, but you need to really understand deeply the secure messaging space and how you position and how you go to market. Sure. You're not ready to, ready to raise money, uh, Alejandro. We just don't have enough uh, of a strategy here to raise money. Sure. You have a is, technology, you have a little bit of validation here and there, yeah. but you really need to make a, you know, the pitch that you do has to be a, a line in, in the ground, right? A stake in the ground that this is the company we're going to build. Right now, from this pitch, I don't know what company you're building. Are we building a legal tech secure messaging company? Are we building a secure messaging framework company that will go to market through the developer network? I don't know. And that is not acceptable for investors. So do you think if I were to say we're going the framework, like we're just trying to cover any type of app, uh, legal mm -hmm. tech, FinTech, health tech, is that already too much? Just saying those three sectors because they're just high trust. Not necessarily, not necessarily, not necessarily, because those are, you know, you're going to run it, you're going to find developer networks where you can go and promote yourself and, sure. and and educate those developer networks and, and developers from different app categories will adopt you and build you into their products. That, that, okay. That's too. That I think is So cool. we could just say that's that's the focus and then the app is just a proof of concept. That's that's something yeah. that we created on the way to where we are now. Before yeah. before getting here, we that's wanted to figure it out. That's fine. That would be fine. That would be fine. But then you have to build the whole pitch around that. This pitch is not an investor pitch. You're going to have to build a full investor pitch around that. Like, what are the assumptions? What is the TAM of that business? Oh, yeah. No, I, I have that pitch deck. I just copied this deck was on your website. Of like, okay. So I just copied. Well, we have like an investor pitch deck with a TAM Samsung and who our target is. Yeah, but it's, but, it's a but longer based deck. Based on what you have shown me here, that investor pitch deck, I'm sure, has all these different paths and and that you're gonna have to pair that down to yeah. one storyline yeah, no, story the investor back. deck the investor deck explains it better but you're right at the at the core of it saying we have an app and we have a framework it, it might be too much right there it's gonna be too much okay and if you do app then i would suggest you do app in one category and then gradually move. Secure messaging as a horizontal thing is fine, but you know, in, typically in enterprise software, we have learned over many, many years that 
going vertical by vertical is a better uh, go-to-market strategy if you do the app. If you do the framework, I think that the way developer networks are set up, you will be able to get into multiple categories of app developers in one go, most likely. You have to study how the developer networks are structured, and, and I think you will be able to penetrate multiple categories in one go. But these are two completely different businesses. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. And, and just from your brief understanding, do you think the framework would be the best way to go? I mean, it's it's easier. I don't like know. I have to look at your TAM analysis. I have to look at, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole lot of analysis that needs to be done sure. before you can make those calls. I don't even know if the developer business is a good business, given what is your, what is your business model assumption, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. So that's what you have to show me to, for me to be able to fully give you advice on this. And uh, that's what I would, if I were introducing into our uh, investor networks, those are the things that I would have you prepare first. And I will work with you to do that before I take you to investors. Sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, we do have a, not to keep it going, but we do actually have like a pitch deck for investors and a pitch deck for the framework. So we even have like just a framework centric uh, pitch mm -hmm. deck as well. That's just focused on that, not about the uh, application. So- Well, if you decide that you want to work within the 1 million by 1 million program, I will go over all of that with you in the private round tables and, and help awesome. you through all of those decision making. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Folks, um, as you can see, I don't mince my words. I give you very direct feedback, and I think that's the only way to be helpful in this business. Giving you a pat on the back, you can get that from your mom. I'm not your mom. So um, if you like this approach, uh, please send other entrepreneurs here, and we're looking for serious entrepreneurs, and we work in tech and tech-enabled services only. So 1mby1m.com is the website where you find all the resources um, anywhere from anybody from anywhere in the world can participate, can leverage this program as much as you want. Um, as far as free resources are concerned, the blog is very rich. You can learn a lot just by following the blog. The Entrepreneur's Journey's book series is based on case studies. We have like 12 to 16 case studies per book. You can use those as well as much as you like. These roundtables happen every week, and uh, you're welcome to come back as many times as you like. You can pitch only once. If you want ongoing feedback and ongoing discussions on your strategy, I encourage you to join the 1M by 1M Premium Program, where we provide extensive methodology guidance, a full digital curriculum. We help you with business development through our network, we help you with strategy consulting, this kind of roundtable model, but you can come back as many times as you want and dialogue with me. We also help you with financing. We work with over 500 investors who look at our deals. Remember one point I make all the time, which is just like you're looking for product market fit, you're gonna need investor entrepreneur fit, and you're gonna, be need, you're gonna need to be introduced to the right set of investors. In one afternoon, I can introduce you to 25 investors, but getting to who are those 25 investors and what are we introducing you with is a process. And that's what increases your probability of fundraising. All right, so um, I encourage you to do the self-assessment. That's a free tool available on the website. These are the questions investors are gonna ask you. These are their due diligence questions. So please try to answer them. If you get stuck, go to 1M by 1M Basic. It is a curriculum only option, um, and you can start plugging your knowledge gaps. Um, I strongly encourage you to do the bootstrapping course and uh, make sure that you understand the philosophy of how we work and how the industry works today. There are certain areas where you can raise a lot of money early on, but most of that is available to repeat founders, people who have done it before. There is some of it available in deep tech, but it requires that you be a you know, world-class expert in your domain. The, the technology domain that you're working on, you need to be a real expert in that to be able to draw that kind of financing. 
For all the rest, you're going to have to bootstrap first and raise money later. All right, so go look around on the website, what to expect from premium, basic. Go look at the FAQs, video FAQs. Look at the curriculum description and decide whether this is for you. We are very much a case study oriented program. We have thousands of successful entrepreneurs who have participated in our case study program. This includes 100 plus unicorn companies. Um, no matter what area of tech startups you are working on, we will probably have case studies that are going to help you, um, you know, understand and make progress in that area. We're very much case study oriented. Investor introductions, it's, a, it's on the website. I strongly recommend that you go look at that as our policy vis-a-vis -vis investor introductions. And um, our methodology is lean capital efficient bootstrap startups. We bootstrap first, raise money later, or not at all. Our philosophy is entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits. Financing is optional. Exit is optional. So that's it. More, lots of more roundtables in June, all throughout June. Um, you can call in now for questions, further dialogue. You can also, um, you know, unmute your line and, and talk through the. Uh, computer audio. If you have questions about the program, Irina will answer your questions. Her email is irina at one m by one mcom And that is all for today, unless you have questions. You can type in your questions in the public chat or um, dial or, you know, dial in, call in through the computer audio, whatever you would like. Gene is still on. If you have questions for Gene, he, he can also answer. I'd be happy to help. There we go. Anybody? Questions? Here's the dial in number in case you want to dial in. Quiet group, guys. Yeah, right. Speak up. Introduce <laughs> yourself. Tell us where you're joining from, what you're working on. No, no. I mean, I guess I guess I would ask with with Gene, uh, you know, the, the the cold calling. I mean, I, I like the even renting a booth uh, idea because I feel like it's 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 kind of hard to get in front of a ton of people. I mean, we we unfortunately got hit with uh, COVID um, when mm -hmm. we we feel like, you know, whether we go the app or framework, you know, we already have something built that we can sell, or the framework. I mean, I guess it's built and you can sell. Um, but just being able to have something that's so demonstrable that I can just show you my screen and you can't see what's there. Um, we feel like it would have been great to be able to go to like conferences and get in front of a bunch of people. But, you know, with do a, us, do a little video, do a little YouTube video that can simulate that experience that you can circulate around. Yeah, no, we, we, we have, we've, we've sent it around, but I guess, it just we haven't had the marketing dollar spend and i think part of uh what gene has done you know being able to uh have that paycheck uh because i'm fully committed uh the, the the founders are fully committed and so we took some pre-seed investment to get to where we are now to build the applications built so we don't really have the money in the bank necessary to to really have like a, a marketing campaign to really get out there and get in front of a bunch of people so we're trying to find the most organic ways uh, to gin up or generate. There are lots of, lots of organic ways, guerrilla marketing ways to get in front of customers, especially the developer networks. Everybody is on the, uh, on, you know, on the internet and you can find these groups where they hang out. And, and we have case study after case study of entrepreneurs who have done great content marketing, have gone in and answered questions in forums and, and engaged with developers and so on. This is, very doable online and very, very doable without spending a dime other than lots of your time. Absolutely. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I like, I, I like, I like that that you mentioned that Gene about the the usability. Like, I think that's really big. That's, yeah, that's, 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 it was, you know, it was just out of sheer necessity, you know, like granted, yeah, we probably all of us had jobs. So you know, we probably could have spent money to pay somebody to do it but you know i think it's it's on the hands of the founders to to get that you know that 
instant feedback, you know, and then, hey, a consumer got stuck at the credit card payment because it didn't look authentic or we forgot to put a, a verified check mark. So all that little, all those little things that, that, you know, you're in it, you see it every day. It's like, oh, this is fine. Well, it's not, you know, it's that, it's that person that's like, oh God, yeah, that's a blatant mistake or something like that. And, you know, we had so many of those, you know, uh, aha moments from, you know, total strangers or, and then you also get your validation from there. Like, oh yeah, this is cool. Um, here's my email address. When you guys do go live, shoot me an email and I'll sign up. So there's kind of benefits to, to kind of, you know, literally getting boots on the ground to, to kind of do that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's one other conversation we had last week, actually, um, with the guest who was on, it was an investor guest, and he was talking at length about how much their portfolio companies have benefited during COVID because enterprises are now able, willing to just you know, close deals, sign deals, just on the basis of Zoom calls. So the whole buying cycle has changed, and this is going to be tremendously helpful for people like you, Alejandro, who are trying to sell, you know, on a shoestring to enterprises. All you need to do is be able to, you know, connect with people, and, and you can just do it from your computer and not have to travel around and, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is going to be a massive change in how technology is sold and technology is bought, even at the enterprise level. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, they've mentioned our technology to be like a virtual uh, notary, because you know that if I send you a contract, you're the only person seeing it, the only person signing it. So that's another feature mm -hmm. we're looking to release, uh, you know, here in the near future. All yeah. right. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you uh, both yes. for coming and, uh, and hope you enjoyed the show, everybody. We'll see you next week if you're Bye. 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 Thanks. Appreciate you guys.